Hey everyone, uh, is, everyone, is everyone awake now? Yeah, you've all had coffee at this point? All right, so, so Swift and I are having a minor argument right now over what's better, the burritos or the sandwiches? Burritos. burritos, okay, if you think the burritos are better, raise your hand. If you think the sandwiches? Okay, I win. <laughs> Awesome. So yeah, I'm here to talk to you about logistics today. Um, let me go ahead and introduce you uh, myself. I'm Shai. Uh, kind of a fun story. Yeah, it's a <laughs> uh, fun story. Uh, about a year and a half ago, actually, um, I'd never organized a developer-focused event before. I'd never organized a hackathon. Uh, and I went to this weird event in New York at this co-working space. Uh, I took a weekend off to like take an overnight bus uh, to like hang out with Swift and uh, John and Dave and a bunch of other like hackathon organizers to learn how to organize a hackathon or a hackathon at the first ever hackathon. Uh, that hackathon like changed my life. Like it, it was one of the best experiences that I ever had, and I'm really jealous that you all get to go through that again uh, and get to use this as your introduction to the hackathon organizing community. Everyone here is phenomenal, and definitely like make sure to take the time to get to know each other. Um, so let's go straight into the talk. WTF is logistics. Let me, let me preface this by going over what logistics isn't. Logistics isn't outreach, logistics isn't sponsorship, and it's not marketing. Logistics is literally everything else. So much that like, my, the name of this talk shouldn't actually be logistics, it should be logistics, i.e. that one super long hackathon talk about literally everything that wasn't related to money and or marketing. So let's go straight into it and talk about hackathon planning. I'll, I'll be upfront with you, organizing a hackathon, it's not easy. It, it takes a lot of time and a lot of work. You're definitely gonna be throwing in a couple sleepless nights. You'll definitely be stressed that your sponsorship isn't being landed or your volunteers aren't stepping up or your registration isn't hitting your targets. And this is true for everyone from like a small hackathon like Hack and Y to like a giant established one like a thousand person, a thousand people at Pen Apps. Uh, what's really important to recognize is that there are some first steps that you need to take and you've already done one of them. You've reached out to us. Uh, our, our goal here at Major League Hacking is to empower you uh, as hackathon organizers. We, we want to be the people that have your back. Um, after you've talked to us uh, and kind of we've introduced you to resources, um, establish a timeline, right? So you need, to, you need to kind of chart out what are you doing uh, for the next four to nine months. So let's talk about that. We're now four to nine months out from your event uh, today. Today is, is day zero of hackathon planning. Um, and the first thing that you need to do before you can really go do anything, before you can start raising sponsorship, before you can uh, put up a website, you need a venue. Uh, you need to lock down your venue before, before you do anything. Uh, and when it comes to venues, there's a couple schools of thoughts here. Um, there's definitely multiple types of hackerspaces. Uh, so thinking back to hackathons that I've attended recently, um, probably the big one that comes to mind as a like, large room is HackMIT or BitCamp. Their thought process is, let's get everyone into the same room, let's get everyone where they can see each other, let's get our sponsors really close to everyone. And I, I personally think this is the best way to run a hackathon, but unfortunately it's, it's not like so perfect. Uh, doing a, a space like this results in all sorts of logistical issues when it comes to power, when it comes to handling Wi-Fi. Uh, these kind of venues are difficult to lock down. They tend to be gyms or basketball courts, uh, and you usually have to fight your administration to find one of these venues. The kind of backup solution is, instead of one single larger room, is a smaller, or set of smaller rooms. Hack and Y does this really well. Um, Revolution you see in Cincinnati does this really well. There's, the majority of hackathons tend to take the smaller room route. You, you uh, risk distilling your community into kind of smaller sub-elements. MHAX does, gets around this by running uh, cortexes and, and kind of theming each of the rooms and building kind of a microscopic community around things like iOS or whatnot. Uh, but with smaller rooms, you, you walk away from those power issues. Odds are classrooms are already set up to handle 30 people um, 
hacking because that's what they do every day. They're definitely already set up for the spread of Wi-Fi. The access points are usually already you know, able to handle it because that's just the standard like day of school for a set of small classrooms. With the, with the Wi-Fi, um, since we're talking about rooms, you definitely need to talk to your IT department or the people providing Wi-Fi for your event. Our rule of thumb is to expect that your hackers are going to show up with four devices. So that's a laptop, a tablet, a smartphone, and maybe a spark core or uh, some other crazy thing. They're definitely going to have a lot of stuff, and you need to be ready for them. If the, if the Wi-Fi doesn't work, they're going to be unhappy with you. Um, same thing with power. Uh, our rule of thumb per power is that our hackers are going to show up with two and a half devices per person. Uh, so again, that's tab you know 100% they're going to have a laptop. You can bet money that they're going to show up with a smartphone, and you know maybe they have something else that they need to plug in. But estimate about two and a half outlets per attendee. Um, also, things like tables. If your venue doesn't provide tables, uh, you need to definitely pay attention to Hammer later in the day when he talks about. Uh, working with vendors for off-site tables. If, you're, if your school will provide tables for you, that's awesome. That's a cost that you don't have to worry about. Same thing with audiovisual. Um, you want to have a venue that has a projector. Uh, ideally, it has an auditorium. If it doesn't, there are ways to get around this. And we've definitely seen some really creative things done. Uh, Treehacks, I know, built this outdoor uh, projection screen that's like absolutely gorgeous in photos. And it, somehow it works really well in like sunlight. Uh, and that's how they got around not having any AV equipment. So definitely, definitely think about these things when you're looking around for your venue. Um, Unfortunately, there's a big elephant in the room when it comes to getting a venue, and that, that's cost. Um, so again, the majority of our hackathons do not pay for their venues. Uh, and ideally, you want to get into the situation where you don't have to pay for your venue. If you, can, if you can cut the venue from your budget, depending on the size of your hackathon, that's saving anywhere from, you know, uh, $5,000 to up to 30k if you're running a thousand person event. Try and get away from paying from your venues. And, and there's a lot of strategies you can employ. Uh, the best one I like to use is going to administration and pointing to, you know, the other schools, pointing to like U Michigan, pointing to Rutgers, and, and really empowering them and challenging them to keep up with computer science. Uh, a dean of engineering that hears um, they have an opportunity that uh, their students are going to do for them to make make them uh, competitive, they're going to take it and odds are they're going to they're gonna help you and try and champion you uh, and get you that free venue. If you can't get that free venue uh, on campus, there are definitely other strategies, startup incubators. Um, like this one, actually, Galvanize uh, is another is like a perfect example of people that are willing to help you know students and, and leverage the fact that you're a student uh, when you're trying to get that venue and that you're trying to help your students. You can offer sponsorship for, for finding a venue, but definitely absolutely try as hard as you can to get that venue for free because um, that'll save you money long term. So you've got a venue, you're four months out, uh, ne there's next couple set of steps. The big one, finalize your team. You should have your team locked down and Tim is going to go over that later uh, about team building. Um, my rule of thumb with the team building is to have someone on top and then have people in charge of logistics, marketing and sponsorship and try and keep the team small and tight uh, and efficient and lean. Um, Establish your brand. So now you have a venue. Now's the time to build a website. Uh, when you build that website, definitely grab your social media handles. I've unfortunately seen hackathons that have had to rebrand because someone is squatting on the, uh, on the Twitter handle after they've launched their website or uh, the Instagram handle. So definitely keep that in mind before you, before you announce everything. Um, create that brand. And with that brand, that's actually a really excellent, um, excellent time for you to, like, uh, espouse why you're doing a hackathon, right? Like hackathons, again, they, they're a lot of work. Um, you're going to be giving up your time and your energy to do that. Uh, so you definitely have to have a reason for it, you know, whether that be uh, sharing, you know, your love of a city with the technology community as a whole, whether that be you want to bring, uh, you know, amazing sponsors like GitHub or A16Z or, uh, you know, Facebook, Venmo, 
uh, MLH, whatever, to your campus and, and be able to share those technologies with your students and really create like a culture and a community of, around like hacking. You have a reason for, for doing one of these events, make that part of your brand. BitCamp does a really excellent job of this with their, their uh, camp uh, metaphor. They really want their hackathon to feel like you're camping. Uh, and they, they let that brand kind of flow through everything. Uh, Hack Illinois, Hack UIUC is another really excellent example of this. Um, they, they know that UIUC is really cold and they make fun of that, right? Panaps also did the same thing. They made fun of the fact that they were bringing everyone to freezing Philadelphia for a weekend. And, and they did some really cool, exciting things. They got an ice rink. They you know, had penguins literally everywhere. Uh, and they actually even made fun of other hackathons by printing hackathon posters of other hackathons in, in a pan app style. Uh, and it was great. And it, it definitely like, was a way to escalate the value of the event. So, so your brand is important. Definitely spend a lot of time thinking about it. And four months out is about time to start. As soon as you have that venue, you need to start working on sponsorship. Sponsorship is really, really hard. Uh, John's going to talk about it at length uh, in a little bit. But definitely like, recognize that um, you need to start closing sponsorship as soon as you can. And, and some companies have weird payment cycles, right? Um, you could have a company that will cut you a check the moment they agree to sponsoring your event. They'll you know, ask for it in the mail and they'll send it to you. Uh, they might need a, they might do what's called a net 30 or a net 90 payment term. So they could pay you in 30 days after closing. They could pay you in 90 days. We've seen like a year um, sponsors like deferring for a year to pay uh, and the students didn't realize it up front. So the sooner you start working on sponsorship, the sooner you'll have money in the bank. And the last thing that you want to do is be putting your hackathon on your credit card because it's expensive and, and no one wants to like have to deal with interest or like a credit card debt. That's definitely not something you want to take take into account. So definitely, definitely start working on that as soon as you have that venue. As soon as you have that venue, you have something that, that qualifies and proves to your sponsors that your hackathon is likely to happen. So definitely leverage that fact. And then the final thing to do at four months out uh, is to reach out to us. Uh, so we'll have, we typically launch our sanctioning process about three or four months before the season starts. So if you want to become a part of the fall season, uh, now is actually the time to reach out to us to join the fall season. If you want to join the spring season, we'll be opening spring season sanctioning in a little bit. And there are all sorts of perks you get. Uh, with being part of MLH, which I think Nick has covered, including things like our safety net, our, our hardware lab. And, and again, our, our real intention is to empower and enable you to, to throw an amazing event. So the sooner you reach out to us, the sooner we can help you. But, but I will be upfront and say we won't sanction events until the venue and the date is finalized. So we're going we're gonna to do some more time travel. Again, we're going to do a lot of time travel today. We're now time traveling to two months away from your hackathon. It's two months away from the first ever uh, loon hacks, or first ever shy hacks. Um, shy hacks, yeah. Everyone, no one talks to each other at shy hacks. We're all through instant messenger and virtual chat at shy hacks. <laughs> um, so yeah, two months out, start your promotion. Uh, you definitely should have a marketing engine. Uh, and we're going to talk more about marketing later. I think Hammer and Taylor are going to go into it in a little bit of detail later on in the day. Marketing is also another thing that takes a lot of work. Uh, you can actually look at the MLH Twitter. Um, we do some really interesting stuff around marketing to try and maintain energy. Uh, I, I see a lot of hackathons fall into the trend where they'll start marketing right before registration is going to open. Uh, they'll have a really big push the day of and maybe they'll send a thank you the day after and then that's it. Definitely you know, start your promotional engines and keep them going throughout the year. Keep, keep the buzz and the spirit of your event alive. Uh, start tweeting about it. Uh, BitCamp, which uh, does a really interesting thing called, call, um, called the 50 days of BitCamp, where they do a big announcement every day prior to the event. And that's a really great way to get people excited, get people wanting to come to your event. Definitely look into some interesting strategies around promotion. Also, two months out is the time to start lining up your prizes. Uh, John is also going to go into more detail about this, but our, our opinion here is that cash prizes are the worst thing since moldy sliced bread. That's the official company line is moldy sliced bread. Um, 
and, and I agree with this personally. Uh, the big reason being, um, and you probably have felt this yourself, you go to a hackathon and you hear that someone's offering a $10,000 prize, in the back of your mind, you've already spent that money. As soon as you hear, I'm offering you 10 k um, you've spent it. And so when you don't win that 10 k because odds are, you know, if it's a 300-person hackathon, that's a, I don't know, one in 300 chance of winning that prize. Um, that, that you'll be really disappointed and you'll be a little let down and, and you'll be hurt. Um, what we think the better thing to do is to provide prizes that continue the spirit of, of hacking, right? So cool prizes involve things like pebbles, right? Something you can continue hacking on. They involve things like Raspberry Pis, uh, the BBC Micro, if you can get a couple of BBC Micros. Anything that like keeps the spirit of hacking alive makes a perfect like thing for a prize. Uh, there's also other things you can do around prizes to, again, extend your promotional engine. UIUC gave out snow globes. Bitcamp gives out 3D printed uh, statues. I honestly think 3D printed mascots of your school mascots are one of the coolest things that you can win. And they're super cheap for you. You just need to you know, buy some filament. Uh, and print it out. And you can even print it out during the event, which makes it really exciting. Uh, so there's definitely be creative with your prizes. Uh, people will be really excited and really proud when they win them. Also, if you, if you are looking for mentors, judges, and judges outside of your sponsors, which you should, you need to start recruiting them about the same time that you start recruiting your participants. Uh, let's say you're in an area with a startup incubator and a really strong startup culture, and you want people, some of those startup people to come you know, judge your event. Now's the time to reach out to them. Uh, same with mentors. If you have alumni that want to come back and want to give back to your community, reach out to them now at two months out. Uh, with judges, I will be upfront and and tell you there are good judges and there are bad judges. Good judges tend to be technical. Um, you need to be upfront with your judges that you're not a startup weekend. There is a wrong question to ask, and that question is how do you make money? If a judge asks you ask that question, you failed as an organizer to prepare your judges for for your event, and you've you've let down your hackers. There's there's nothing worse than you building some amazing technical project and a judge comes up to you and asks you how you make money. So definitely combat that early when you're picking your judges. Same thing with volunteers. Start recruiting your volunteers now. Um, there's a lot of great strategies behind volunteers. I, I know uh, Bryn, if anyone's coming tomorrow, is going to talk about partnerships with service organizations. They're definitely great places to find volunteers. Uh, definitely source your friends. If you have a lot of friends, um, you know, ask them. They'll, they'll volunteer for you. Um, and start letting them know, like, these are things that we need, these are the hours that we have to fill. Like, be sure, like, can you help? Like, and, and no, none of your friends, I hope, are going to say no if you go to them and say, you know, I'm trying to do this great thing, you've seen me working on it for the last uh, two to seven months, like, could you, could you help me? And, and they will, but you need to let them know up front so they can schedule it. Also, two months out is time, if you want to have workshops, it's time to start sourcing them. Um, so again, these could be from your sponsors or they could be from people off campus. Uh, I know where I'm from, Cincinnati has a really strong Ruby community. We had one of the Ruby guys, or one of the guys who maintained Ruby lived in Cincinnati, so we reached out to him and asked him to come to our hackathon. And because we gave him a heads up, he was you know, more than willing to come attend. Um, there's definitely some pros and cons when it comes to workshops. Pros. Um, your workshops can be really great and they can be really impactful. One of the best workshops I think I saw was from uh, Kushal Parikh, who used to organize HackRU. He gave it at McGill Hacks and he, this was right after the Tinder API had been exposed and he walked everyone through uh, exposing the Tinder API. Swift gives an amazing how to, how to be a badass hacker workshop. Uh, there's definitely some really excellent workshops you can get, but again, you need to give people a heads up that you want them to do that workshop. You need to give them a heads up to prepare. People are going to have their workshop, you know, want to have time to do their workshops. I know um, it's not, I mean, it's pretty typical that people have their workshops done a few weeks out. They're not going to be working on them uh, prior to Nick walking out and telling, telling you that you're on. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, so definitely give them time to, to work on them if you want high quality stuff. Unfortunately, there are cons with workshops, right? Um, you could promise a sponsor uh, a workshop with a thousand people attending and they want to give a workshop on SEO and none of your hackers like, could give a damn. Um, 
like sourcing workshops isn't necessarily the best thing in the world. Realize like your hackers are people too. A good rule of thumb is if you wouldn't go to that workshop, you probably shouldn't like let someone give it. Um, and also like the closer you get to the end of hacking, the less people are going to show up to that workshop. You don't have to have workshops. Uh, and especially if your sponsors ask you to give workshops, vet them. Um, if they're a developer evangelist and they've given that workshop before and you've seen it and you think it's great, that's awesome, let them do it. If they're a recruiting sponsor and they're really using this as an opportunity to shell resumes, maybe, maybe push back a little bit um, because no one will come. And then the last thing you need to do is launch your registration. You need to start finding out who's coming uh, and start being able to establish like a head count uh, and get people's emails. You can definitely keep emailing them and keep them excited. Um, and get their information. With registration, there's a basic set of things that we ask for. Um, we ask for uh, name, um, school, major, uh, and there's all this information on the MLH uh, sanctioning process. Also some like interesting suggested ones, t-shirt sizes, food preferences, uh, gender identity, uh, race, so you can do some analytics of your demographic and, and set yourself some targets to improve on going forward. Uh, definitely ask those questions and, and make sure that during your registration, uh, and we'll communicate this with you again through your sanctioning process, that people know that your event would have a code of conduct and that you need to you have an expectation that your attendees are abiding by this code of conduct. So it's time for some more time travel. We're jumping ahead another month. Uh, it's now a month out from your hackathon. Your last um, three to eight months of planning have gone phenomenally. You have a lot of sponsorship money in the bank. You have a ton of hackers coming. The first thing you need to do at a month out is establish your headcount. Uh, and in establishing our headcount, we have to talk about one of the kind of dirty secrets in hackathon organizing. We have to talk about hackathon attrition. Um, now this, this attrition kind of sucks. Uh, attrition is essentially the number of people that sign up to attend your event and you know, don't make it to, to demo day or to submission day. Um, there's different like, calculations you can do to sort of estimate it, estimate it, but our rule of thumb is one third to one half of the participants that attend your event will not show up. Uh, and that makes it really, really hard to, to organize food, to get t-shirts. Um, but you, you know for a fact that as a free event, one third to one half of the people won't make it to the final day. Um, the good rule of thumb there is that if someone is coming from outside of your campus to your event, odds are they're more likely to, uh, to attrition before they check in. Uh, once they get there, they're probably gonna stay there because it could be six hours to get home on a bus or you know, a flight. Um, people on your campus, if you have a lot of students from your campus uh, attending your event, uh, odds are a decent chunk of them aren't going to make it to the final day. Um, they're going to get tired, they're going to go home and go to sleep, and they're not going to come back. And there's nothing that you can do, for, do about that, but you can definitely plan around it. And you can definitely try uh, and employ strategies to maintain energy and keep, get people to come back. But you do need to keep in mind that if you're organizing a 100-person hackathon and you, only, you close your registration after you get 100 registrants, odds are 50 people are going to show up. Uh, definitely over-register and, and keep that in mind. It's, it's really important and it happens to, to small hackathons like App Hacks all the way to you know, big 2,000 person ones like Hack, Hack the North. Um, if you want to do bus, buses and Swift uh, is going to go more into buses later, um, you need to schedule your buses at about a month out. You need to reach out to organizers at other schools and have them work with you to fill those buses. And the same attrition strategy applies here. If you have a 40 person bus, you need to get 70 people to sign up for it if you want it to be full. Um, but there's definitely some really interesting things you can do around buses um, and strategically uh, deploy them to get a lot of people from a lot of different schools. I know I once jumped on a bus to Canada um, that went from, uh, from Hack FSU, from Florida State, up to the University of Cincinnati where I went to school, up to Michigan, and then a 16-hour drive into uh, Ontario or wherever McGill Hacks was. Um, so people are willing to take these absurdly long bus rides, but they just, again, they need to be able to plan for them uh, and standard attrition applies. The next thing you need to do at a month out, now is the time to order your swag. Um, Hammer is going to talk more about swag and specifically working with vendors later. My rule of thumb is, like, if your swag isn't high quality, odds are people aren't going to wear it, you know, 
an event or two down. If you get the $3 Gildan's t-shirt, odds are like they they might wear it the day of and then it's just going to go back, you know, the back of their closet uh, and they're going to wear the like 50/50 Digital Ocean shirt that they got that day or the like, you know, um Teespring Yellow Pages shirt because it's just more comfortable. So if you want people to wear your shirts, um get high quality stuff. If you want people to continue using your swag, uh, and again, your swag is, a, is an opportunity for you to spread the branding of your event, post event. It definitely needs to be high quality. Something interesting that we did uh, for local hack day was we gave out these beanies. And these beanies are super nice, incredibly warm. Uh, they weren't that expensive because we were creative about it, but they, they felt premium and they felt exclusive. So people were more likely to use them. And we see a lot of photos of people at hackathons, you know, wearing those hats, even though they're in Austin, Texas, and it's abysmally warm. They're still wearing those hats. Um, MLH does not endorse heat stroke, by the way. So, <laughs> so don't wear a hat in, in 80 degree weather. Um, a month out, you also need to start ordering your food. Um, there's, again, there's a couple train of thoughts around food, too. Uh, like everything, when it comes to hackathon organizing, everything is kind of div is, uh, you know, a pro and con about different strategies. Uh, the two strategies you have around food are catering, so on-campus catering or an off-campus caterer versus sourcing it from local restaurants. Um, with on-campus catering, odds are you're going to pay more. Um, odds are the food isn't going to be quite as good, but there is, you know, there's like, like everything, there's a trade-off. The trade-off being positive there is that um, after maybe one or two times coming and setting your event, so this is the same caterer doing food for every event, they're going to have it down, right? You know, that third meal, they don't need you to help them anymore. They know where they're going. They know what the, the participants are like. They know what to expect. Um, they're just going to roll with it, right? Uh, which could be nice if you're short on like a volunteer staff and if you have like an excess of money, uh, a caterer could be great. Or if you're forced into it by your university, if you have an error mark or that kind of situation on campus in, in your venue, um, you could do that. Um, if you're actually forced into using error mark, sometimes they have a list of approved vendors and you can kind of get around it. Um, I've also seen strategies where people will move the food into a fraternity house that's across the street from the venue so they don't have to pay for the on-campus strategy. Definitely be creative. Uh, with local restaurants, and, and this is my personal preference, um, you're going to see a lot, more, um, a lot more variety in your meals. Your meals are going to be cheaper because you can negotiate individually with your vendor. Uh, Swift and Hammer are both going to talk about the rule of seven, which is that your meals should average out to being seven bucks per, per meal. So lunch is seven, dinner is more expensive, breakfast is less expensive. Um, keep that in mind when you order. Definitely negotiate a lot harder. Um, and and I'll, I'll let you in on another like secret. Uh, we've, we've started doing data collection around like the participant experience. So we're sending out surveys after every event. Um, and we did some, so we have about, you know, 2,000 points of data um, in the survey right now across 20 hackathons. Uh, the one single thing that influences your participants' experience and perception of how your event did overall, statistically, is your food. If you, if you do pizza, pasta, and subs, your food scores are going to plummet. And if your food scores plummet, your overall event scores are going to plummet. I know, you know, Jimmy John's and Pizza Hut might be cheaper. Um, but if you can get away from them, if you can find a local provider on campus that does, you know, really amazing Indian food, or if you know, like, like this is the Thai guy, right? Like everyone on our campus loves Thai food, and we go to this one place. Go get that Thai vendor. Um, go get that Indian food vendor. Go get that baklava person. Go get that like exciting local food, um, and bring that to your hackathon and, and celebrate like the cuisine in your area. Universities tend to have a lot of really amazing food around them to support college students. Celebrate that. And, and odds are, if you've been you know, visiting an Indian restaurant for the past four years of your collegiate career, they're going to recognize you. They're going to know your name, and they're going to cut you a discount. I may be speaking from personal preference there, from, from visiting the same Indian restaurant every week for four years of university. The guy like, was like, Shah, you're doing an event? Uh, let me see how cheap I can get. Uh, definitely take advantage of that. And people loved it, right? People love uh, not getting subs and not getting pizza. Um, so definitely keep that in mind and definitely use food as like a way to keep things special. 
at a month out, you want to release your schedule. So if you look at us for HackCon, we released our schedule for HackCon about a month out. We're going to be releasing our schedule for Hack the Planet in a little bit because uh, we're about there. And make sure you have everything in order in case an emergency happens. Nick is going to go over incident response later. Um, but like, if your university has an on-campus police department that you ha has a different number from 911, Make sure you know that. Make sure you reach out to them and, and are ready to call that you know, on-campus police number if you need to. Same thing with ambulance. Uh, make sure you know where your first aid kit is or your CPR kit. I know in New York there's a, there's a sign in almost every establishment that says where the CPR kit is. Make sure you know where that stuff is so if something terrible does happen, you're ready to deal with it. Uh, the last thing that you want is someone to have hurt themselves and you, you don't have like the preparation or like the knowledge to handle that situation appropriately. So it's time for some time travel again. We're now a week away from your hackathon. Uh, you're getting really nervous now. Like you're not sleeping anymore um, because you're so excited. Uh, your mom is really angry at you because you've stopped calling her. Like all sorts of things are happening right now because you know your grades are slipping. Your professors are like giving you the stink eye because you haven't shown up to class in you know a couple weeks. Um, now you need to start sending reminders. Uh, and these reminders need to go to a lot of people. You need to remind your sponsors that your event is happening. You need to reach out to your vendors and confirm that they know when and where they need to be. Um, double and triple check with your vendors. The last thing that you want is to have a vendor that has promised to bring you food not show up because they misscheduled it. And then reach out to your students. Um, with your students and your sponsors, especially for the students that are coming from on campus and the sponsors that aren't you know, specific for your school, they have no idea where your campus is, right? Um, they have no idea where to go. They don't know where to park. They don't know like, what their sleeping arrangements are. Odds are, even though you've released the schedule, they haven't paid attention to it. Uh, they've probably forgotten that the code of conduct exists. They probably have forgotten that you know, they need to bring their computers. Over communicate to them what they need to know. You know, be very, very descriptive with your sponsors. Provide them a map. You know, maybe a link to Google Maps with a picture of the route to, to your event from a major highway. Um, over communicate how you get there. Over communicate what they need to do when they get there. Uh, let them know how to get a hold of you if there's you know an emergency. Uh, for sponsors, I would give them your direct phone number. Like, make yourself available to them. Prepare your volunteers. Have a, you know, have a meeting with all your volunteers and go over, this is the logistics of our hackathon. This is our expectations for you as a volunteer. This is what we need. Share, share why you're doing it with your volunteers too. Make sure that they know and that they've bought in to what your vision is, right? Your volunteers are there to like help you out and have your back, but you need to, you need to loop them into that. And then buy snacks. Go on your Costco run. This is the, the most fun thing, I think, about organizing a hackathon is when you go to Costco with a U-Haul um, and you have $1,000 on your credit card and you're just like pulling things off the shelves, like, like buying absurd amounts of water and throwing them in a U-Haul, like buying an obscene amount of snacks and bananas and you know, gummy bears and like whatever you, you know, whatever you want. Think of it as like, uh, I don't know if, if you all are young enough to remember like the Nickelodeon shows when they would put people, you know, in a in a trolley. They would give them a trolley and have them run in a mall and like everything that they could get in their trolley they got to keep. Channel that experience because that's what buying snacks is right is like before a hackathon. It's an awesome feeling and you'll like take a photo of it and tweet it out and it'd be, be like, I can't believe we're doing this. This is like completely ridiculous. Um, with your snacks, you definitely want to have a mix of unhealthy and healthy snacks, right? Um, there's going to be a point in your hackathon where people have been guzzling Red, Red Bull and they're like, God damn it, I just want a fucking apple. Like, <laughs> so, so make sure that's available, right? Um, definitely provide like, alternatives. And, and I tend to see that like, even though you'll do that like, half divide between healthy and unhealthy, like, people are going to tend to like, gravitate towards one, but you really can't predict which way they're going to go. Um, in the past 12 months, I've run two Hack and Y hackathons in New York. The first one went crazy for the fruit, and the fruit was completely gone, and we had an absurd amount of leftovers of chips and popcorn and candy and whatever. And the second Hack and Y was the exact opposite. The fruit 
was left there, which was great because I didn't eat breakfast or I didn't buy breakfast for a week. But you know, all of the junk food was gone. Um, definitely buy snacks. Uh, there's also a lot of like kind of personal care stuff that you can buy at this point. Um, you know, so buy mouthwash at this point, buy toothbrushes, recognize the fact that you're going to have female hackers in attendance. And, you know, one of the nice things that you can do is buy feminine hygiene products and just throw it in the bathroom and, you know, make that available. Do all that kind of like general care stuff um, at that week out and make sure that you cover like all of those things at that point. And then one of the last things that you need to do is create a run of show. So I haven't actually told anyone on the MLH team what I'm about to show you. So Swift might yell at me about this after the event. But this is like the run of show for HatCon, right? So we've gone into like absurd detail by the minute of what is going on at the event. Oh. Yeah, what's going on uh, today, right? Like we know uh, where everyone is at all times. So I know Nico and Carl, who aren't here right now, are setting up registration as we speak because we've pre-plotted that. Uh, I know when people are going to arrive. I know when people are going to leave. I know when my vendors are going to show up. Have this much detail in your organizing team, and you can share parts of this with your volunteers. Um, definitely like coordinate to this level of detail uh, and like do a virtual run through right like sit sit down and take this from the perspective of okay I'm a sponsor I've never been to my uni your university before this is what my process is going to be right like I'm going to show up uh, I'm going to call such and such or such and such person is going to be you know there in a loon hacks or a shy hacks t-shirt you know at the parking lot we're going to have signs that are going to direct people or you know I'm a student this is my process or I'm a, an organizer, this is my process, you know, run through the entire event for you and, and be able to plan and have everything in writing. And then this is really important. Make sure that you plot time in for sleep. Uh, there have been studies that prove that like a lack of sleep reduce your ability to like function cognitively. Um, I'm not saying you need to get nine hours. If you can, if you can somehow make it work that you can disappear for nine hours, that's that's great, great planning. Um, but definitely, like, set it up in such a way that you know um, when you're going to sleep, and and be mean about it. Like, if someone is supposed to be sleeping, yell at them until they go to sleep. The the last thing that you want to happen is to have your entire organizing team pass out at 4 a.m. and then at 7 a.m a food vendor arrives and no one knows where the organizers are and there's no plan to deal with that. I've been to a ton of hackathons um, where I as a other hackathon organizer from another school have had to step up and coordinate the food uh, because all of the other hackathon organizers are asleep because they didn't plan for the fact that they're human beings and they need to rest. Uh, I'll also make note that if you have never tried Red Bull before or if you've never drank coffee before, now is not the time to try it. Right? <laughs> like, like, if you're going to drink energy drinks or drink coffee to like help you through it, make sure you know what that does to your body before you do it. Don't plan a schedule like, I'm going to take coffee for the first time ever, and that's going to keep me awake for four extra hours. That's bullshit. Like, like, you're, like know your limits. Know the limits of your, your co-organizers, and accept that you're, you know, you're human and that you will need to sleep and go to sleep. Uh, so. We're doing some more time travel. It's now the day before the hackathon. We are at pre-hackathon, or it's the day of the hackathon. You're starting to set your event up. The major things to keep in mind are you need to establish a place for registration. The registration is a two-fold thing, right? The registration is one for your, for your attendees to check in. This is the first place that they're going to be introduced to your hackathon. This is um, the first impression that your hackers are going to get of you. Do registration smoothly. Have everyone there be really excited and really energized. Uh, if you have a friend that is very like gloomy, uh, don't put them at registration. <laughs> Definitely not, not like is the first thing. Um, same thing with your sponsors. You need to welcome your sponsors. You should be excited that your sponsors are there. You should be thanking them for coming. They're taking the time out of their day uh, to spend their weekend with you. Your sponsors don't necessarily have to be working on weekends, uh, especially if they're like recruiters. Working on weekends is irregular, so be thankful. Be grateful for them. Um, but recognize that your sponsors are there for your hackers. and 
introduce them to your hackers as soon as you can. And, and there's some really great strategies that you can do to enable this. One of the best things you should do is put your sponsors with your hackers, right? If you have a large room, you shouldn't put your sponsors in another atrium, you know, a mile and a half away. Put them in there in the heart of it, right? Like either wrap the, wrap the hacking with your mentors, or if you're doing classrooms, spread it out in a way that like the sponsors are in the, the halls and the classrooms. Your sponsors, like they're not there because they, they buy into your vision. They're there because they want access to your participants. So enable them to get that access to your participants. And then your participants also need help with stuff. And your sponsors are, your, are some of your best mentors. So enable your participants to easily get access to your sponsors. Start putting out the food. Um, some people might have driven or have been on a bus for 16 hours from Canada, from Michigan to Canada. And they're really hungry. Feed them. Definitely feed them. Uh, whether this is like you know, a pizza. So at Hack and Y, uh, we recognize that people have been on the bus since 6 a.m. Uh, getting to Hack and Y, so we order pizza for them at noon. Even though I hate pizza, we put it out because people are hungry and they need to eat. So put out food. Uh, that could be snacks too. Like make sure your snacks are out. If people are hungry, let them eat. And then do a tech check. So for those, of the, uh, for those people that are gonna be presenting, Call them into your, into your opening ceremony area. Have them plug their computers in. If they need sound, that's when they'll probably tell you and you can double check that the sound works on your system. Same thing with your power and your Wi-Fi. Uh, your power and your Wi-Fi, you need to make sure everything is ready, so double and triple check that. Um, some interesting stuff to keep in mind with Wi-Fi is have like a backup Wi-Fi system. Um, what tends to be the major problem with Wi-Fi uh, at events is that um, your access points will get overloaded uh, because there are too many people logging onto your Wi-Fi points. So if you have Ethernet available, you'd be able to like convert to a partially wired network and alleviate some of this uh, burden. Uh, I know the first ever hackathon I went to, the hackathon that inspired me to organize hackathons was Hack MIT, organized by Ishan, who's one of the hackathon organizers. Um, and Ishan tasked myself uh, an organizer from Penn, an organizer from RU, to convert the entirety of Hack MIT into a wired network, uh, and they called us wire bitches. Um, so, like, if you need to, if you need to make that conversion, have that ready, um, and be, be, you know, be ready for it. Double check everything. Uh, if your power and Wi-Fi doesn't work, like your hackers are going to leave, and they're going to go work out of a hotel, and they're going to be unhappy. And there are plenty of blog posts from participants in the hackathon community that have had that like um, experience. So definitely try and avoid that if you can. So we're jumping into your opening ceremonies. Your opening ceremonies are the thing that sets the tone for the entire event. Uh, so much that I actually want to give an example of what I do to set the tone at an event as an MLH rep. Is Jared here? Did Jared leave? All right, so everyone, I want everyone to stand up and we're going to take a selfie right now. You've been sitting down for like an hour, so let's take a break. Swift, can I borrow your phone? <laughs> so everyone, everyone come together. Let's huddle in the middle, right? Right, and, and this, is, this is actually the point, right? Some of you are laughing. This is, this is creating energy. And this is something that you can do to like, make sure that your hackathon starts off in, like, in a great way. All right. Everyone say HackCon on three. One, two, three. <laughs> so yeah, so yeah, set the tone. Get everyone excited. Get everyone pumped. I'm feeling excited now. You're excited. Yeah. You know, welcome everyone to your event. Um, again, now is a good time to share your reasoning for throwing the hackathon. I think my favorite hackathon that did this was Delta Hacks. Uh, the organizer of Delta Hacks, Janelle, you know, went up on stage and you know, she said she'd been working on this hackathon for a year and a half and she goes into the backstory of it and everyone was so impressed because they realized how much work she'd put into it. And it really started the hackathon in like, this amazing way that like, uh, stayed for the rest of the event. Definitely, if you have API demos, do them now. With your API demos, uh, something to keep in mind is you don't necessarily have to offer them as a sponsorship perk. Uh, you could invite people that you know that give great API demos to give those API demos. Uh, and be respectful of your hacker's time, right? Like, if you're giving away API demos, you're essentially selling their time. Uh, so keep that in mind, right? Like, don't, don't spend two hours in opening ceremony on, like, API demos. I've been to those hackathons. 
they're not fun, right? Like, and, and you can look around the room and see everyone's eyes, is, eyes are glazed over. Your opening ceremonies are your first impression for everyone there of what your hackathon is gonna be like. So be respectful of everyone there and, and definitely keep the energy up. Hmm? Uh, so we're gonna do some more jumping. It's now the hackathon itself. Uh, opening ceremonies are over. First thing you're gonna do is you're gonna run a team formation workshop. This is something MLH can help you with. Um, the next thing that you're going to do is start working on maintaining energy, right? So some of the things you can do are continue to put out energy drinks, run mini events, you know, have contests, keep tweeting, um, and be visible, right? So like if you as a hackathon organizer disappear from your hackathon, your, your participants are going to realize that. Definitely like make sure people know that, that, your hack that like, you as an organizing team are there. Have people in your staff shirts walking around, trying to make themselves helpful. Your hackers are going to get hungry, so our rule of thumb is to feed them every six hours. Um, so that's like breakfast, lunch, dinner, midnight snack, uh, whatever. Feed them every six hours. Uh, keep putting out snacks. Keep refilling your, your water and your drinks. Uh, if you have a large, large room, this is really easy to coordinate. You just have your snacks in a corner. If you have smaller classrooms spread over campus, you need to have multiple snack access points. Uh, so keep that in mind. And then the most important thing to do here is take a moment to stop, right? Stop, stop being an organizer for a second. Stop, you know, being, being the head organizer of Loon Hacks and stop being responsible for everyone there and just walk into the middle of it and just look around. You've, you've just spent the last nine months working on this, this like thing uh, and, and it's come together and that's really special and that's really, really empowering. You should be proud of yourself for organizing a hackathon. You are awesome. That slide that the picture is on there, it's right. It's verbatim right. You as a hackathon organizer have done something that you should be proud of. So take a moment to recognize that uh, and feel that. And then, uh, so the last thing you need to do during the hackathon submission or the hackathon period is to start sourcing hackathon submissions, right? You need to um, start asking people to submit. I would lie to them, right? Lie and tell them the deadline is an hour earlier than it actually is. Uh, people are going to not submit until the judging period has started. Uh, I've been at hackathons where someone has come up to me and they've been like, yeah, I didn't get the challenge post submission in on time. I didn't get the hacker league submission in on time. Can I still like give a submission? And you begrudgingly say yes, but you can minimize that by lying and saying the hackathon submission period closes an hour before the, it actually does. Uh, have people walk around and tell you, you know, say, it's time to submit your demo. It's time to submit your hack. Um, make it clear. Blast it out in email. Blast it out on Twitter. Let everyone know that, <laughs> that project submission is coming. Uh, and this is something uh, that leads into judging. Judging is something, is an area that MLH is definitely able to help you with. Um, so we're going to jump forward to judging. It's now the judging period. Everyone submitted. Uh, you've caught that one person that submitted after the deadline, and you've accounted for them in your system. You have, you have two options here at this point. You, have, uh, you can either do a presentation style, like Hack and Y, uh, or you can do an expo, like mHacks or PenApps. Um, there's definitely pros and cons with each. So presentation style, presentation style is only really manageable up to a certain limit. Once you get over maybe 30 or 40 you know, submissions, presentation style is now no longer a viable option. It would take all day. Uh, if you're under that limit, you can definitely get it done in an hour and a half, maybe two hours. Uh, and that's when you bring everyone up to the stage. They have a minute, two minutes, uh, and they show everyone what they've done uh, in front of their stage. Uh, and I really like presentation style. I think presentation style is a lot of fun, especially if people have practiced. Um, the other style is expo style. So HackFSU does expo, expo style. The majority of our hackathons do expo style. This is where you set up a whole bunch of tables, everyone puts their project on the table, and then you have your judges walking around. Expo style brings in a whole host of new logistical problems, right? Um, and again, MLH is really good at solving those logistical problems. We have this system internally that we call stack ranking. Um, stack ranking, how many people in here have taken linear algebra? Okay, so you'll have, uh, so to explain it for those of you, it's, it's, it's like a math problem, right? Uh, you have a set of a, um, 
of uh, hackers that want to demo. You have a set of judges that want to demo. How do you reduce that set of participants down to like a final top 10 or to like a top one, top two, top three? Uh, what we do is we break our judges into zones. So. Um, you know, we'll have hackathon submission project from 1 through 10, 10 through 20, 21 through 30, whatever, all the way up. Uh, and we will assign judges to each of those zones. Uh, and those judges will find, will judge that. And so they'll come back and say, the best hack out of, you know, hackathon submission 1 through 10 was this. And you reestablish a new set, right? So you now have uh, a new, you know, you call a list of 100 down to 10, and then you repeat the process. And, and this is something that MLH is really great at coordinating. Um, if you're going to run expo judging, I would work with us and definitely talk to us if you want us to do this. This is something that we're really good at. We have a lot of experience. Judging is going to stress you out. Uh, opening ceremonies are going to stress you out, and closing ceremonies are going to stress you out. And we can definitely help alleviate some of those stresses, especially in the judging period. Um, so definitely talk to us and we are more than happy to like run that period for you or help you run that period if that's something you want to do yourself. So it's now your closing. Uh, I know I said this before, but definitely respect your participants' time. Your participants are at this point exhausted. They've been there for 24 to 36 to 48 hours. They want to go home. Um, don't, now is not the time to have the dean of your university come give a 20-minute talk on why you should get a master's degree at you know, the University of Loons or whatever. Uh, that would have been the beginning of the hackathon, and even then, that's probably not something you should do anyway. Um, so definitely keep, it, keep in mind people want to leave. Uh, if you do a final presentation for your like top five from your demo, have those people do a tech check before they go on. Uh, most of them will have weird, crazy setups because the things that they've built, you know, have been around for 24 hours. There's definitely no polish on like AV output or any of that. You know, they might not know that their site needs to be responsive because your projecting technology is through VGA and is only like a 640 by 480 output. Definitely have them plug their stuff in and see how it looks and make sure that it works. Uh, one of the other things that you can do is grab those developer evangelists that have come and sponsored your events. Uh, something when I was competing uh, or when I was a hacker was John actually was at an event with me uh, and I made it to the final round and we do the tech check and then John pulls me to the side uh, and he's like, Shai, give me your pitch right now. And, and I did my two minute pitch in front of him and he told me it was crap and he told me why it was crap. And when we gave the pitch for real, it was much better and the crowd was entertained. If we'd done that pitch you know, without practicing, the crowd would have hated it and they would have been bored. And, and you don't want your, your hackers to be bored. You want them to be excited and to be energized. And your developer evangelists uh, are the people that do this for a living. Their job is to give cool technical presentations in, start in front of large audiences. So definitely leverage them. And then when you're done with that, thank everyone that came. Thank your volunteers, thank your facilities management, thank your administration, thank your hackers, and thank your sponsors. Say thank you to everyone, thank your, you know, thank your parents. Uh, pretend it's the Oscars, thank everyone. Um, you couldn't have done this hackathon alone. You're not perfect. Um, you definitely had help, so recognize the fact that you've had help, and, and now's the chance to like, say thank you to everyone. So it's now after the event. You have one thing you need to do as soon as the event is over. You need to go home and you need to go to sleep. <laughs> Recover, you know, regain your mental like function. Now is not the time to send follow-ups. Definitely go to sleep first. If you're going to do any form of communication between the end of the event and you going to sleep, have it automated and you wrote it while you were sane. Go to bed. Recover. Um, after you wake up, definitely follow up. Again, thank everyone for coming. Um, your sponsors, you know, if they're going to want to come back, uh, send them pictures. Send them a list of all the people that hacked on their platform. Uh, I love it when people send, you know, send us thank yous as MLH. We, we like treasure every thank you card. We have them all on the wall. Um, so like, say thank you to everyone. You don't have to send us a thank you note, but definitely send a thank you note to your sponsors. Uh, thank your participants for giving up their weekends to come. Thank your volunteers. Take your volunteers out for dinner, right? This is something super easy that you can do. Take your volunteers out for like a meal and feed them and like cover that cost. Uh, budget that into your cost that you're going to feed your volunteers. Um, there's all sorts of things that you can do to follow up. Make sure that you do them. Settle your books. Uh, again, John and Swift are going to go into this in more detail with their sponsorship and their budgeting talks. Um, 
if you've put your hackathon on your credit card, make sure that you get that money and pay off your credit card bill. Uh, if you need to like, find, you know, hunt down your sponsors to give you your money, make sure you handle that. Um, if you need to reimburse your volunteers because they went on an emergency, you know, water run because you went and got water, now is the time to tell them is to like take care of all that, get your receipts in order. Um, if you're a nonprofit or an external like LLC, make sure your books are settled so when taxes come around, you can handle those. And start collecting successor stories, right? So your hackathon was awesome. You need to keep a record of that. Uh, and you need to keep a record of that so you can let people know why your hackathon was successful. And so when you do this again, it's much easier. Um, there's this scene in Casino Royale where James Bond in the beginning has killed, uh, is like going to murder someone to do his like kill to get his double O status. And the guy is sitting behind a desk uh, and he's like, the second kill is much easier than the first. And then Bond shoots him and says considerably. It's the same thing with hackathon organizing. Um, the second hackathon is considerably easier to organize than the first because you have like proof that you've done this, right? Like, you don't necessarily need to get people to buy into your event. You don't have to convince them that your event is solid. You have tangible, concrete evidence that your hackathon was solid. So make sure to collect that evidence. Uh, if you're not running that hackathon next year because you're graduating or because you, you know, need to step back and focus on the MCAT or, you know, your master's degree or, you know, just need to get your grades up because they've slipped because you've been, you know, spending the nine months bumming, the last nine months ignoring your academics to organize this hackathon uh, and you, you, need to, you need to get your grades up, make sure that you hand out all that information to your next organizers and the people that will be following you. Uh, what you do by starting a hackathon is set the tone um, and a legacy going forward. I know Hack and Why has been around for like 12 generations now and so has Pen Apps and like the legacy of things that uh, people did at the beginning still affect like your organizers 10 or 12 generations out. So like, make sure to prov like keep resources and keep records of what you did so that people in the future can use them. So I know this was an obnoxiously long talk, um, and I don't expect you to have taken notes or to remember this. Um, we have a written record and a written resource that has all of this information in more detail. Uh, it's the guide. Uh, it's guide.mlh.io. Um, go there. It has all of this detail, or all of this information in more detail, in more depth. There are YouTube videos that go into specific elements for like an hour. We have a workshop on organizing buses. I, you know, commented on it for about 10 seconds. Uh, if you want more, Swift will talk to you about it for an hour on YouTube. So definitely leverage the guide. It's, I think, one of the things that I'm proudest of that MLH has put out of. So definitely use it uh, if you want more detail. Otherwise, if anyone has any questions, I can take them now. I, I'll repeat the question. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, so the question is, um, I, uh, Dave said that he knows that we're going to lose attendees before the event, anywhere between a third to a half. Uh, is there more detail that you can provide about uh, losing people before the event versus during the event, if I'm saying it correctly? Um, again, so there's a lot of kind of strategic stuff you can do around it. You can take a look at the uh, number of people that are coming and where they're coming from since you asked for their school. Uh, and you can see, like, okay, if this certain percentage of people is coming from out of state, uh, if they're outside three hours and we're not providing them a bus and we're not providing them travel reimbursement, the odds of us co of them coming is significantly lower versus if they're at our university. Uh, and you can be a little strategic about it there. Um, the same thing with on campus. Like, you know, like, you can kind of take a look around and get a feel for, like, how people's energy levels are, and, like, if they're from your university, if they're going to be coming. Um, Definitely just like take a look at your data and take a look at where people are coming from. Vikram from MHAX has a really interesting uh, philosophy on like data modeling against like where people are coming from. And I know he's going to go into more detail about that tomorrow or uh, soon. So, any other questions? What's up? Okay. Mm hmm. They're there. Yeah, so, so the question was, um, 
you're throwing a 24, ha 24 hour hackathon rather than a 36 hour hackathon. You're looking to accommodate the people that travel uh, on a Friday that won't be you know, ready to hack until Saturday morning, if that's correct. Um, so I would definitely reach out to people on campus. Um, run Airbnb for your hackathon. Um, like if you have a lot of friends or if you're in a fraternity or a sorority and there's a lot of extra beds, definitely like reach out to those people. I know for Hack Princeton, um, back in 2014, 2013, uh, I crashed in a fraternity house and like the hackathon organizers had set that up that like um, that was the fraternity house where everyone went um, because they weren't allowed to actually have people sleep during the venue so they you know, set up an off-campus fraternity. So definitely reach out to those people. Uh, again, students don't want to pay money for this kind of stuff. Uh, odds are they're not going to book a hotel. So if you can like book them an accommodation on someone's couch and just kind of crowdsource that out, that's that's a great way to kind of like get around that problem. I think you had a question. So the question was, have I had experience with uh, sponsors requesting to organize workshops before the hackathon? Uh, my response to that is no. I have not personally had to deal with that, but I have a lot of friends that have. Uh, PenApps does this uh, where the week prior is when they have all their workshops happen and they'll invite all their sponsors. Uh, again, with everything, there's pros and cons to this. The cons being that um, you're, not all of your participants at your hackathon are going to be able to take part in those workshops. Uh, I know. Uh, I couldn't just drive to Penn to like listen to a Facebook talk like, you know, on a Tuesday and then go back to class, you know, Tuesday afternoon. Um, but then the other side, like, you do remove those workshops from your hackathon and you have like a higher chance of people going to them. So there's definitely pros and cons to, to both of them and you should keep those in mind uh, depending on either strategy that you provide. I'm not saying that one of them is better or worse, they're just, you know, trade-offs. All right, I think, unless there are any other questions, there is another talk that is about to happen. Uh, I'm going to hand it off to Swift.